Welcome to the fourth annual Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture. Professor William Powell Jones addresses the topic, Why We Need Public Employee Unions. The lecture was recorded on March 29, 2011, at the Milwaukee Public Library's Centennial Hall. Here is Central Library Manager Christine Arkenberg. Good evening. On behalf of Library Director Paula Kiley, welcome to the fourth annual Frank P. Seidler Memorial Lecture. I am Chris Arkenberg, Central Library Manager. Milwaukee Public Library is delighted to host this event in the Central Library's Centennial Hall. My thanks go to the Library's Coordinator of Humanities and Archives, Virginia Schwartz, for representing the Library on the Planning Committee. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ames McInnes. Dr. McInnes is an Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's History Department and a member of the Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture Committee. Dr. McInnes. Thank you very much, Chris. On behalf of the lecture committee, I would like to welcome you to the fourth annual Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture. Our distinguished speaker is William P. Jones, and the title of his lecture is Why We Need Public Employee Unions. When Mr. Zeidler first ran for mayor of Milwaukee in 1947, his campaign platform called for the recognition of the collective bargaining rights of public employees. Mr. Zeidler won that election, and he is best known today for his contributions as mayor of this city between 1948 and 1960. Less well known are his achievements as a mediator and arbitrator working with different facets of government, public employees, and public employee unions, work that he continued literally until the day of his death on July 7, 2006, at the age of 93. By the way that he lived and the way he earned his own bread, Mr. Zeidler showed us that our society is best served when we sit down together and negotiate in good faith with civility and a mutual recognition of the rights and responsibilities of all. William Cronin wrote recently that, quote, Wisconsinites have long believed that common problems deserve common solutions and that when something needs fixing, we should roll up our sleeves and work together, no matter what our politics, to achieve the common good. In my opinion, there has never been a better embodiment of that tradition than Frank Zeidler, the man in whose honor we gather tonight. There are many people to thank for this evening's event. The lecture committee would like to recognize in particular the Argosy Foundation, the International Institute of Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee Public Television. Professor Jones has generously donated his honorarium to the Memorial Lecture Fund, information about which can be found in tonight's program. I would also like to recognize the presence of members of Mr. Zeidler's family who have been kind enough to join us this evening, including his daughter, Anita Zeidler, and his daughter, Dorothy Zeidler, um, as well as, I believe, uh, his niece, uh, Maxine Dodge. Thank you very much for your presence. <laughs> Will Jones is an associate professor of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For some years, he was also our cherished colleague in the history department at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He earned his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is the award-winning author of The Tribe of Black Ulysses, African-American Lumber Workers in the Jim Crow South, published by the University of Illinois Press. He is completing a history of the role of labor in the Great March on Washington of 1963 as well as a history of public employee unions in the United States. 
he has emerged as one of the most eloquent and informed voices in the ongoing struggle over the future of collective bargaining rights of public workers in our state and in our nation. It is thus an honor for me and a pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Professor William P. Jones. Thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Is, is this, uh, I, um, I was lecturing this afternoon in, in, uh, in Madison, and I, start, I started to lose my voice. And I didn't really realize it until uh, a graduate student who works with me, who also works as a teaching assistant in the class, came up to me afterward and said, can I get you a cup of tea? And, and, I, and I realized that I, my voice was getting really raspy. So um, I, I lecture actually usually in a class, in a, in a, a, a room that's slightly bigger than this, and I don't tend to use a mic. Um, so that's probably why I was losing my voice. Um, so hopefully the mic will work. Um, I want to just uh, thank the, the lecture committee, and particularly Ames, for inviting me to give this lecture. It's a really tremendous honor uh, to give a lecture in honor of, uh, named for Frank Zeidler. Um, a man who has wisdom that I, had wisdom that I think we particularly need today, um, in, in particularly in his defense of the idea that, that government can be a positive force in society, that government not only does things that the private sector cannot do, but often can do them more effectively and more efficiently than private business. And on one hand, I think, sort of as a historian, it seems absurd to me that we'd have to even say that. It's, it's such an obvious sentiment. But I think it's, it's a sentiment that's remarkably rare today. And I think it's uh, particularly appropriate that we, sit, that we remember uh, somebody like Frank Zeidler, who really dedicated his life to that principle. Um, I also want to start by uh, addressing a misconception about Frank Zeidler that which is that he was opposed to public employee unions. Um, this is a, it's a misconception that's based on a series of quotes that have been taken uh, out of context and circulated on the internet. They've been picked up by the, by the local Milwaukee paper. Uh, and these are quotes that come from a statement that was written uh, by Frank Seidler in 1969. So this was after he was, he was no longer mayor, he was working as Ames uh, mentioned as, as a mediator and an arbitrator for the city. And he expressed concern about the impact that collective bargaining had on city government. As he said, uh, collective bargaining can, and I'm quoting here, mean considerable loss of control over the budget and hence over tax rates and over government programs and projects. Now these quotes have been interpreted to mean that Zeidler, as, mentioned, as Ames mentioned, the last socialist mayor of Milwaukee, uh, a man who had strong support from unions in the public sector, uh, as well as in the private sector, um, that he opposed uh, unionization of public employees. Now, there's several obvious problems with that. One is the platform that he ran on in 1948, which Ames mentioned, uh, that it advocated collective bargaining rights for city employees. This is before uh, the, the passage in 1959 of the, the statewide law giving collective bargaining rights. So this was, he was in fact a pioneer uh, in granting, in, in arguing for collective bargaining rights for city employees. Uh, he, but most importantly was the fact that Zeidler was a strong supporter of unions throughout his whole life. He worked closely with them throughout his career uh, in politics. And, and so I think if we sort of t look more carefully at the statement, it becomes clear that he recognized that unions do present a challenge to government. But he also saw that the solution was in negotiation, not, not in, in eliminating unions as, as a feature. Uh, and in fact, if you read the whole passage from which these quotes are taken, it's actually clear that the purpose of the passage was not to criticize unions, but was actually directed at public officials, at management who had refused to deal with public employee unions, even as they grew into formidable forces. Uh, and I'll read a section which is usually not circulated on the internet, which says, as is usually the case, 
The ostrich, ostrich stance was a mistake. And by ostrich, he's referring to public officials who do not negotiate with unions. As he said, the reason was because when public em employee organizations suddenly burgeoned, and he's writing in the late 1960s, when after a really massive, a rapid growth of public employee unions in the United States and in Wisconsin specifically, he said, when this happened, municipal employees or municipal officials were not prepared with effective rejoinders before legislators and in negotiations. Uh, so I think the, the, the statement actually s displays a, a intellectual sophistication that was typical of Zeidler and sadly often lacking in his critics, that unionization does present a challenge to public employees. It forces them to balance the needs of public employees with their, ne their duty to serve the public. But, but Frank Zeidler didn't see this as a reason to ban unions. In fact, he argued that this was a reason to negotiate with unions and to deal with them in a rational way. Uh, he did argue that public employee unions should not have the right to strike, and this was a position that he took repeatedly throughout his career. Uh, and this grew out of a recognition that public employee unions were different from those in the private sector, that collective bargaining has to operate differently in the public sector than it does um, in the private sector. But that unionization in the public sector is not only possible, but it's actually a promotion, it promotes the social good. It's beneficial to all people uh, who are involved in this process. Now, I think it's interesting that a somewhat similar position uh, less uh, fully articulated was taken by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt three decades earlier in a letter that's also often used to claim that Roosevelt himself was opposed to collective bargaining in the public sector. Now, this is a letter that Franklin Roosevelt wrote in 1937, and this is two months after the U.S. Supreme Court uh, upheld the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act, or the Wagner Act, which uh, encouraged collective bargaining and unionization in private industry. Um, Luther Seward, who was the president of the National Federation of Federal Employees, wrote to, uh, to Roosevelt after this ruling, and he said, does this apply to public employees? And in short, Roosevelt said no. He wrote, and I'll quote here, all government employees should realize that the process of collective bargaining, as usually understood, cannot be transplanted into the public service. Now, this is the part that's often been circulated around the internet. You've probably seen it in print, uh, again, proving in the eyes of some that uh, even the great uh, pro-union president of the 1930s was opposed to unionization. Um, once again, this quote is taken out of context, and rarely do we actually see the, pro the paragraph that precedes that, in which Roosevelt wrote, the desire of government employees for fair and adequate pay, reasonable hours of work, safe and suitable working conditions, development of opportunities for advancement, facilities for fair and impartial consideration, and review of grievances, and other objectives of a proper employee relations policy is basically no different from that of employees in private industry. And he continued, organization on their part to present their views on such matters is both natural and logical. But, he added, meticulous attention should be paid to the special relationships and obligations of public servants to the public itself and to the government. So like Zeidler, Roosevelt acknowledged the legitimacy of public employee organization. He acknowledged that public employees have legitimate needs that are, quote, basically no different from those of, of, of employees in private industry. And like Frank Zeidler, he recognized that those needs had to be addressed in a different way than the way they were addressed in private industry. They had to, as he said, address the special relationships and obligations of public, and ser of public servants to the public itself and to the government. And this is why public employees were excluded from the Wagner Act, which granted collective bargaining rights to workers in private industry. Um, 
but it did not stop public employees from forming unions and demanding the right to bargain collectively, uh, starting uh, even before the passage of the Wagner Act. Uh, or seeking, um, in fact, uh, the emergence of collective bargaining in the public sector was closely related to the success of the Wagner Act and sort of the comparison that people started to draw between workers who had the rights of collective bargaining that were protected under the Wagner Act and workers who didn't. And I think I'd, I'd note that this wasn't just public employees, but it was also uh, farm workers, agricultural employees, and domestic servants who were also excluded from these collective bargaining measures. And this immediately set up a, an economic and a political uh, uh, inequality between workers in these different sectors. Um, you saw in the 1940s and 1950s a really unprecedented rise in wages and benefits for industrial workers. Uh, we now often see factory jobs as quote unquote good jobs, right? We assume that, they, that there's something about working in a factory that should endow you with the right uh, to a decent wage and decent benefits. But this, of course, was not always the case, and it was directly related to the rise of, in, of unions in, the, in, in, in heavy industry in the 1940s and 1950s. Workers got access to health insurance. They got the ability to buy homes and send their children to college, all things that a generation earlier would have been unheard of for working class families. These were things that were associated with the middle class. And in fact, in the 1950s, people routinely said, looked at unions and said, unions have transformed workers into, into middle class Americans and created what I think we now often nostalgically look back at as our great middle class. Uh, the benefits of collective bargaining in industry were not, did not only go to workers, however. Management also appreciated collective bargaining. This provided a legal avenue, a rational avenue for resolving conflicts. It led to a marked decline in the number of strikes in the 1950s, a healthier and more contented workforce, and also a workforce that earned enough to purchase the goods that they were manufacturing, which of course created a huge market for manufactured goods and had played a critical role in driving the economic expansion of the United States in the 1950s. Um, and so through this, I think it's important that we don't romanticize labor relations in uh, industry in the 1950s. There was still, still serious conflict, uh, some of which occurred here in Milwaukee and around the state. But there was a wide perception that this was a system that worked, that, that, that created an avenue for resolving conflicts before they blew up. And there was a, this stood in really stark contrast to what happened in the public sector in the 1940s and 50s, where wages and benefits uh, very quickly lagged far behind those uh, of the private sector. Uh, as I mentioned, public employees were, were excluded from the Wagner Act. They were also excluded from the Social Security Act. They were excluded from even from federal minimum wage laws. Um, as a result, in Wisconsin, the average wages in the, 19, in the late 1950s, uh, the average wages for an industrial worker were about $2 an hour. Um, doesn't seem much by today's standards. Uh, public employees, the average wage was about a dollar and a half an hour, so significantly less. Uh, in New York City, it was common for hospital workers uh, to work 60 hours a week and still, um, and still rely on public assistance. Uh, the wages were so low that they, again, were far below the federal, even the federal minimum wage uh, standards, which themselves were far below uh, what the average industrial worker was making at the time. And this really highlighted not just a divide between, public, between workers in the public and private sector, but a growing divide just between the public and private sectors that, uh, that, that social scientists, economists, uh, labor relations re experts uh, increasingly noticed. Um, one of, I, I think, uh, just an illustration of the sort of the contradictions that were built into this. If you think about hospital workers uh, being on public assistance after working 60-hour weeks, 
Um, now, hospital workers, the reason that hospital workers were employed in very large numbers in the 1950s is that workers in industry were gaining access to health care, right? So there was an increased demand for access to hospitals. So you have the workers who are providing the services that people are getting because they're bargaining collectively. They don't even have the rights to bargain collectively uh, that the, the, the workers they're serving are uh, enjoying. And this, this contradiction um, became increasingly apparent. Uh, this, this contrast and contradiction was exacerbated by a growing, increasing, and an increasing racial divide between workers in the public and the private sectors. Um, at this point, many public jobs became, uh, uh, became an employment niche for African Americans, many of whom were leaving farming and domestic service and were shut out of industrial jobs. And I think another, we, we often retain a sort of nostalgic memory of a period, uh, usually sometime in the 1960s, when African Americans had access to good paying industrial jobs. That was actually a very brief period, usually, actually between the passage of the Civil Rights Act that um, in 1964 that prohibited employment discrimination and the point at which uh, industrial jobs started to close uh, in places like Milwaukee and other cities and move away. So there, there, was, a, there was a very brief period when uh, industrial employment was a really important uh, route of employment for African Americans. But before that, that role was really filled by uh, public service jobs. Um, Public employment was uh, less discriminatory. It was more open to African Americans, in large part because white workers were actually leaving public employment for jobs in industry. So because of this disparity, anybody who could get out was trying to get a job in a factory. Um, these are jobs, that, the jobs that were filled by African Americans in the 1940s and 50s uh, were at the lowest wage scale of the public sector, uh, garbage collection, food service, uh, maids and janitors jobs in public institutions, uh, non-professional hospital jobs, so nurses aides, doctors assistants, food service in, uh, in public hospitals. These were really the growth sectors of public employment for African Americans. And in fact, these were the growth sectors of employment in the United States. In the late, starting in the late 1950s, uh, I'm sorry, in the late 1940s, uh, this type of low-wage public service work was the fastest growing sector for employment in the United States, largely, again, as the result of people gaining greater access to things like education and health care and these public services. Um, there were better paid uh, public jobs, white collar jobs, and even, but even in those, they tended to be paid and rewarded at a far lower level than jobs in the private sector. Uh, these uh, partially as a result of the fact that these were largely female occupations, uh, what is known as pink collar work, uh, teaching, nursing. Um, that again, in which the wages and the benefits were suppressed significantly below the standards in private industry. So by the 1950s, there was a widespread recognition of these disparities. Um, John Kenneth Galbraith, the influential economist, pointed to what he called the contrast between private opulence and public squalor. Uh, pointing to the fact that the, the 1950s was a period of unprecedented economic growth and yet a tragic neglect of the public sector. Uh, he pointed to New York City, perhaps the wealthiest city in the world at the time, where yet schools were old and uh, overcrowded, the police force was under strength and underpaid, the parks and playgrounds were insufficient, streets and empty lots were filthy, and the sanitation staff was under-equipped and in need of men. This reflected, uh, in Galbraith's view, this reflected the widespread assumption that economic growth came only from the private sector, so that private investment was the only uh, engine of economic growth. Uh, and he offered a very powerful critique of a problem that, or an attitude that I think actually, I, I think many of us will recognize today, the argument that, you know, that the only valid place to grow the economy, the only place to put, to stimulate growth is in private industry and that the, the growth of jobs in the public sector is somehow uh, irrelevant and at, at best and, uh, and damaging to the economy at worst. As Galbraith said, at best public services are a necessary evil, 
at worst, they are a malign tendency against which an alert community must exercise eternal vigilance, this idea that the public sector is sort of a threat. And I think many of us will recognize that type of rhetoric uh, in today's political climate. Um, <clears throat> he pointed out that this harmed all citizens, the idea that they do not have access to public services, but that it harmed public employees most of all. It led those who could to seek opportunities for employment in the private sector and led those who could not enter private industrial work to fall behind. Um, while economists pointed to this growing disparity between public and private employees, other scholars noted that there were somewhat arbitrary differences even between workers who were in the public sector and in the private sector. Why, for example, should a truck driver who works for the city have different wages and different rights uh, than a truck, dri truck driver who works for a private company. Uh, and these disparities were evident in a lot of cases. Janitors, for example. Why should a janitor be different uh, working for a school than working uh, in an office building? Uh, even nurses and teachers in public and private schools. What difference did it make that they worked for the public or the private sector? And there was actually a dramatic illustration of this in the 1940s when the subway system in New York City, which had been operated by private companies, uh, and, it, and, and the, the, uh, the, the workers in the subway system uh, had formed unions and started bargaining collectively under the Wagner Act, those companies went, uh, went into bankruptcy during the Second World War, and the city bought the, bought the subway from the companies. Uh, so suddenly, these workers who had enjoyed uh, collective bargaining rights under the Wagner Act were threatened with losing their collective bargaining rights. Um, they, they actually went on strike. They shut down the New York City subway for a, a little over a week uh, and forced the city to recognize their existing contracts and then to start bargaining collectively with them. And this actually led, this became an important opening for people who argued that, you know, look, this is really arbitrary. There's no reason why some people should have collective bargaining rights and some people should not. Um, so by the 1950s, there was a widespread demand for a legal change coming primarily from workers, uh, but also from scholars in industrial relations, in economics. Um, and the final push came from unions, primarily AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, uh, which had been founded in, in Madison, Wisconsin, by Wisconsin State employees uh, in 1932. Um, initially, AFSCME was hardly a typical union. It was sort of, it was actually founded by very well-educated state bureaucrats in Madison. It, was the, it became the only uh, affiliate of the American Federation of Labor that was led by somebody who had a PhD. So the president of AFSCME initially had a PhD. Uh, these were workers that were primarily concerned with changes in the, collect in the, the civil service system. So they were, they were concerned about their rights being undermined. Um, and they, for the most part, accepted the position articulated by Roosevelt that the, the Wagner Act could not be extended to government. But this actually changed as a result of a really important change within AFSCME in the 1940s that was driven by this growth of, uh, of low-wage public service employment, primarily at the municipal level. Uh, and AFSCME very quickly in the 1940s gained, uh, became a union that was predominantly urban, uh, low-wage, uh, blue-collar, public service employees. Uh, this it was in places it, it, uh, in Milwaukee, uh, also Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, another, a number of other big cities. Um, and as I said, the growth was primarily in low-wage public services, janitors, garbage collectors, um, maids, uh, and hos low-wage hospital workers. Uh, and these were people who saw very little advantage in the civil service system. And there was a number of reasons for this. One was that municip many municipal governments did not follow the same civil service rules as the state government. Um, even when they did, many, uh, many municipal, or municipal governments actually excluded low-wage workers from those rules. For, so, for example, it was typical for garbage collectors to be employed not as permanent employees, but as day laborers. So this meant that they could work for the city for 20, 30 years, but every day they would show up and either get hired or not get hired. So they, were, they had absolutely no uh, stability of employment, 
and no rights uh, once they were employed. And this, these were the people that pushed AFSCME to start uh, pushing for collective bargaining rights in the 1940s. Um, now, AFSCME at the time, uh, despite the, the sort of historical memory, was not powerful enough to actually change these laws. It was a, still a very small union. Uh, but it gained support from scholars and increasingly from public officials like Mayor Zeidler, who recognized that the way in which this was operating at a sort of haphazard way without any uh, formal process of negotiation uh, was not working. Uh, so, so Zeidler uh, started to enter into informal agreements with city employees in Milwaukee. Uh, Philadelphia and New York actually instituted, uh, primarily through executive orders, in for, uh, sort of formal systems for negotiating with their employees. Uh, and, and Wisconsin, in 1959, became the first state to pass a statewide collective bargaining law. It, it initially actually only applied to municipal employees, but over time was expanded to cover uh, the, the, the state workers as well. Uh, these laws were very quickly copied by other governments. Uh, President John F. Kennedy uh, issued an executive order in 1962 giving federal employees, uh, most federal employees, the right to collective bargaining. Um, 28 states in the District of Columbia have since then adopted laws that are similar to the one passed in Wisconsin in 1959. Now, I think it's important that we remember uh, at this moment the degree to which that the, the law that was passed in Wisconsin and the ones that were modeled on it uh, explicitly recognized those special relationships uh, designated by Roosevelt. I want to read a passage from the law. It says, it recognizes that there are three major interests involved, namely the public, the employee, and the employer. These three interests are to a considerable extent interrelated. It is the policy of the state to protect and promote each of these interests with due regard to the situation and to the rights of the others. Um, so you see that from the very beginning, this law is written with the recognition that public employee collective bargaining is not the same as private employee collective bargaining. In the private sector, there are two parties, right? Employee and employer. Uh, in the public sector, there are three. And the law was explicitly designed to recognize that difference. These laws were, in many respects, much more restrictive than the Wagner Act. For example, for the most part, almost all of them restricted or prohibited strikes and provided either heavy fines or even jail time for public employees who went on strike. Again, this is consistent with Frank Zeidler's belief that strikes uh, were not acceptable in the public sector. They, would, uh, they led to disruptions of public services, often very critical public services. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the private sector, the right to strike is actually a really critical element, element of the Wagner Act. Um, so instead of, of allowing strikes, these laws created systems of arbitration, which were often implemented explicitly as an alternative to strikes. So we will, we will give, again, it's a way of providing a system for negotiating and handling differences of opinion and conflicts of interest. Um, these laws were copied because they worked. They, dramatically narrowed the gap between public and private sector uh, wages uh, and benefits. Um, in Wisconsin, currently, uh, total compensation for uh, public employees, so if you look at wages and benefits, total compensation for public employees is slightly above, on a whole, uh, workers in the private sector. So if you, look, if you compare all the workers in the public sector, all the workers in the private sector, public sector workers do make slightly more uh, than workers in the private sector. There's import, a couple of important things to keep in mind about that. Um, the most important one is that public employees tend to be far more educated than private sector employees. So in Wisconsin, for example, 60% of public employees hold a college degree. In the private sector, roughly 30% of private sector workers hold a college degree. So public employees are twice as well educated or twice as likely to hold a college degree. Um, and so if you actually, if you account for education, public employees make far less than private employees. But what's important, I think, to keep in mind about the impact of these laws is that the gap has narrowed significantly since the 1950s. So uh, the, the effect of the law, uh, if you read sort of contemporary debates, 
you'd think that the effect of the law would, would be to sort of create um, this, this, uh, this privileged class of public employees. What it's actually done is create parity and equality between uh, the, two, the two sectors. Um, there were also important non-economic gains. Uh, the collective bargaining led to formal grievance procedures, seniority rules, protections from discrimination on the basis of race or gender, uh, health and safety rules. Um, the most famous conflict over public employee collective bargaining rights in the 1960s uh, was a, a, a strike by sanitation workers in the city of Memphis in 1968. Um, this was a strike that was uh, in which the, the, the workers who belonged to AFSCME, the, the union that was founded in Madison, uh, went on strike uh, for wage increases, changes to working conditions, but their central demand was the right to bargain collectively and to have a contract that was recognized by the city. Um, these were all, all of the, the workers in, the, uh, in this union were African American men. Uh, they were, as was common, they pre before this worked as day, day laborers, so they had no, absolutely no rights on the job. Um, and in fact, the, the strike was actually sparked by a horrific incident in which two of the workers uh, were caught in the rain in a, in a downpour, and they went into the back of the garbage truck to take, to take respite from the storm. Um, the machinery in the garbage truck was m malfunctioned. Uh, it was actually machinery that the workers had complained about several times. The compactor went off without, or turned on without them knowing it, and they were crushed to death. And this was the incident that started the strike uh, in which these, the, the rest of their coworkers went out and argued that collective bargaining was necessary not just for their, their wages and their working uh, their, and their benefits, but for their, their safety at work. Um, this is a strike that gained support from uh, the, the labor movement and also from civil rights activists. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, went to Memphis to uh, speak on behalf of these workers and argued that the, 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 that the struggle for collective bargaining in the public sector was critical to the broader struggle for racial equality in the 1960s. As he said, uh, speaking, this is a quote from a speech he gave on April 3rd, 1968, in which he told the strikers, you are demanding that this city will respect the dignity of labor. So often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and it has worth. Martin Luther King was, was assassinated the day after he gave that speech uh, on April 4th, 1968, uh, as he prepared to march in solidarity with these workers. Uh, and, uh, on, and this Monday is the, is the 43rd anniversary of that date, um, and is actually unions have called for a national day of action uh, to remember Martin Luther King uh, in the events surrounding his death and particularly the relationship between collective bargaining rights for public employees and the struggle for racial equality. So collective bargaining was really critical to the rights of the workers in the public sector. But I think it's also important, particularly given the way in which we've been talking about this issue uh, today, collective bargaining also advanced the interests of the public. Taxpayers obviously have an interest in creating uh, safe and healthy workplaces. Accidents are, are costly and disruptive, not just for the, the workers, but for the people who rely on the services they provide. Um, workplace safety rules and seniority allow people to be employed on the basis of their, their merits and their experience and training, rather than arbitrary distinctions, uh, primarily before this on the basis of race or gender. Uh, so it rewards workers for their experience and their training. Unions in the public sector have also had a really important political impact um, in defending public services that are used by all citizens, uh, making them stronger, and making them more effective and more efficient. And part of the, 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 the workplace safety rules are part of that. The, uh, uh, the hiring and firing rules are, are part of that. Um, workers 
in the public sector have also de uh, demanded things that are primarily, you know, sort of initially self-interested, but that have a broader impact on the on the people who use their services. So one example of that is limitations on class sizes in schools, right? So that's something that is obviously in the interest of the teacher who doesn't want to be teaching 50 kids a day, um, but it's also in the interest of the students who, don't, who aren't going to learn anything if they're in classes with 50 other students. Um, another example of this is limitations on patient no loads for nurses and hospital workers, right? Who, on one hand, you know, it limits the amount of um, attention that, it, it increases the amount of attention that they can give to their patients and they can do their jobs better. So I think it's important to keep in mind that these rules, while they may appear on the surface to be inconvenient, they actually not only benefit the workers, but they also benefit the people who they are serving. Um, public employee unions, uh, in addition to, their, to this sort of defense of public services, have also become in many places, the only organized voice for working class voters. And this is particularly true of African Americans in most cities in the country. Um, AFSCME and other public employee unions have become a training ground for political leadership. Um, I believe Marvin Pratt is a former AFSCME local president. Um, I, I think that's an example of somebody who gained his political training and emerged from the public sector into uh, public office. That's true of, of many individuals across the country and an important role that public employee unions have played. Um, finally, collective bargaining has clearly benefited public officials. Um, I think this is seen in the letters that state leaders have been receiving from, from, uh, from local mayors and county board officials, school boards, uh, pointing out that the current changes to collective bargaining laws in Wisconsin uh, threaten a system that they have benefited from and that they believe has made it easier for them to do, do their job in uh, representing the public. Um, so I think all of this together is an indication that the law that was passed in 1959 accomplished what it was intended to do and was an effective law uh, and that was, a, that was what it was primarily intended to do was not simply to advance the interests of public employees, but to create a system for balancing the sometimes contradictory but often uh, aligned interests of three parties, public employees, public officials, and the public at large. This system has not worked perfectly. Uh, it's often created headaches for public officials, even Frank Zeidler. Uh, it's increased wages that have certainly increased the tax burden. But I think as Frank Zeidler recognized, these are challenges that are worth confronting. They bring benefits not just to public employees, but to the society as a whole. And this is a dynamic that I think is arguably more important now than in the 1950s before these laws were passed. Um, and this is due to the rapid decline of unions in the private sector, which has led to a loss of wages and benefits in the, for private industrial workers. Um, and I think clearly has made public employees more vulnerable to criticism. So this has fed the charge that public employees are sort of fat cats that are living off the taxpayers. Um, but I think on the other hand, it's also made them symbols of the rights and benefits that other people have lost. And, and emblems of, of why the, how important those rights are. Um, I think we've seen that clearly in the protests against the efforts to, to undermine these rights uh, here in Wisconsin and in other states, which has gained, uh, I think, remarkable support from uh, unions and individual workers in the private sector, I think, who recognize that, uh, that, that they, even if they don't have the same things that public employees have, they have a stake in, de in defending those, those rights. Um, I think it's a, it, this has been motivated by a recognition that attacks on public employees represent a broader attack on all of our standards of living, uh, the, and the standards of living for anyone who works for a living and, and the public services that we all depend upon. And I think this is a recognition that would have made Frank Zeidler proud. And I think these demonstrations um, have him smiling upon us. Um, it certainly makes me proud to live in a state that he called his home. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Professor Jones. Uh, we now have some time uh, for, for some questions. Um, Mr. Gary Shellman, who's a distinguished historian in his own right, will moderate questions that audience members have submitted on blank cards. Thank you, Ames, and thank you very much, Dr. Jones. I believe you captured the public spirit of Frank Zeidler beautifully. <laughs> uh, first question. Congressman Paul Ryan has been cited in print claiming that the progressive era and the New Deal are responsible, not Wall Street, for today's economic problems. Does this view represent a national Republican strategy to turn back the clock on the U.S. economy to possibly an ungilded era? <laughs> it's a trick question. <laughs> um, well, I won't, I, I, I'm not sure what, I've actually tried several times in the past couple months to figure out what the national Republican strategy is, or even the one at the state level, and I can't, I can't, I can't comprehend it. So I'm not going to try to do that. Um, I do think that, I mean, it's interesting the, the, the sort of association of these attacks on um, the legacy of the New Deal, um, which I think has been a very difficult uh, legacy for uh, conservatives to take on directly uh, uh, up until pretty recently. And I'm surprised by the sort of boldness of this, um, partially because of the degree to which so many people rely on and benefit from the legacy of the New Deal. I mean, things like uh, the, the fact that it's, it's widely assumed that if you have a full-time job uh, in you know, a decent job, that you should be able to buy a house, right? The idea, the idea that that, that the sort of average American would buy a house, which if you told people in the 1920s that sort of average people would buy houses, they would look at you like you were crazy. I mean, the, when, at a time when, when to buy a house, you would have to put up uh, roughly 60%, 70% of the price of a house uh, on a mortgage. That's the way it was before uh, the FHA, and particularly before the GI Bill made uh, homeownership a, a common thing. Um, I think you can see these, this dynamic if, you, if people start talking about cuts to uh, Social Security, for example, which again is one of these legacies of the New Deal that, you know, that people will bash. Uh, but when you actually start talking about getting rid of them, people realize how, how dependent they are on them. And I think, um, so I, I think there's a, it's, it's a dangerous strategy if it is one. And I, and I hope that it's one that, um, that people will, will, will take a serious look at. With the passage of the recent disputed bill in Madison, can public employees uh, ch choose to confine the relationship they have with the unions, employers that is, choose to continue the relationship they have with the unions? Well, my under this is actually an interesting point because um, before the law was passed in 1959, um, there was sort of the absence of a, of a law, which meant that uh, particularly at the municipal level, um, if governments wanted to, they could enter into uh, informal negotiations and in some cases actually sign contracts with unions. Uh, they were un they were, they would, there was no legal process for going through collective bargaining, but they could sign a contract and it would, be, it would have strength under contract law. The effect of the way in which the current law has been um, written is that it, it, it maintains the law, but it, it cr writes it in a way that makes collective bargaining almost impossible for most uh, public employees. And so it actually prevents uh, municipal employees or municipal governments from creating their own system, from signing these, these contracts. So it explicitly, for example, says that collective bargaining can only be over wages uh, and that wages cannot rise faster than the consumer price index. Um, so it means that even if a, even if a mayor uh, wanted to actually start negotiating with their employees over things like health insurance or uh, other benefits, workplace rules, even things like you know, anti-discrimination rules, uh, they, they, that, that mayor would be barred from doing that. So it's actually, in some re respects, we're in a legal system that, or a legal situation that's more restrictive than the one before the, the, the 1959 law was passed. In view of current attacks on public employee unions, what possibility do you see for mutual support and recognition between private and public unions in the future? Um, well, I, 
I, I think that the, the way in which the law that um, I we can talk about whether it's in effect or not, I don't, I don't know what, what the status of the law, the law that has been signed by the governor, um, I know that. Uh, the, it, the, the, the way in which it's written, it really does make it, in my view, impossible to maintain unions in the public sector. Um, there's a couple of details that I'll share with you. Uh, it requires unions to, unions can only sign contracts for one year, so they constantly have to be renegotiating contracts. Uh, they have to have a recertification election every year, so they're basically going to be either going through contract negotiations or trying to run a, a recertification campaign. Often they're going to be doing both at the same time. Uh, if they win that, the only thing they can, they can bargain over are wages, as long as those wages do not rise faster than the consumer price index. So unions are going to be running like crazy their entire year, and there's not really much they can deliver for that, right? They can't really give much to their, to their members. Um, the way in which the election law, is, this is really remarkable, the, the way in which the election law is written is that public employee or unions have to get the support in an election of 50% of the eligible voters of the so of the collective bargaining unit. Um, so not just 50% of the people who vote. Now what that means is that anybody who stays home is effectively voting against the union. It also means I'll point out that in the past governor's election we had 50% turnout in the state, right? So the governor was elected with roughly 26% of the eligible vote. Um, now that's, that, that's low, but I don't think there's an there's a, a elected official in the country who could claim to have gotten 50% of the eligible voters in any election. I mean, it's clearly designed to make it impossible to win an election. So I guess to get back to the question, I think the seriousness of the situation is that we're, if this law stays in effect for more than a few years, we're not going to be talking about public employee unions having relationships with private employee unions. There, the public employee unions will continue, but as tiny skeletons of their former self. Um, I think this, this is clearly, uh, the, the trend has been a broader attack on unions in the, public, in the private sector as well. Uh, the, the, the National Labor Relations Act, uh, its ability, the ability to enforce uh, rules under the National Labor Relations Act has pretty much been gutted to the point that it's, it's pretty much, it's fairly easy to fire a worker for trying to form a union, uh, for not negotiating with a union. Um, so I think we can anticipate a continued decline of workers, uh, or of unions in the private sector, as well as in, at least in Wisconsin, a decline in the public sector um, if the laws stay in place, which I don't know, you know, that's, that's an open question at the, at the moment. Why were public employees excluded from the Wagner Act of the late 1930s? Well, primarily because of this difference between the two sectors, that there was a, a recognition that public employees, uh, it, that bargaining had to account for the public in the public sector, and, and that's why they, that, that's the primary reason why they were excluded. Uh, it has been said that public of, uh, elected officials wanted to put many money late into because it was cheaper than increasing salaries. Therefore, employees took a little. Oh, I'm having trouble reading it. I think, uh, I, I, think I know what yeah. the question is getting yeah. at. It's actually a really interesting question, um, if I interpret it right, and I'll just make it up if I don't. But. Uh, <laughs> I have an interesting thing to say, and I'll use this question to say it. <laughs> um, but I think what it's getting at is the fact that in the past, public employee unions have agreed to take uh, lower increases in wages as, uh, in exchange for better benefits packages. And what's really fascinating is that this, these attacks, the current attacks on public employee unions are very similar to a wave of attacks that happened in the late 1970s when many cities were going through uh, uh, financial crises similar to the, what's happening at the state level today. And public employee unions uh, negotiated deals that would allow these cities to uh, weather the um, the financial crisis. So in the New York in New York City, it, the the AFSCME local actually uh, donated or loaned the city from its pension plan 
over $2 million to help it weather the financial crisis and get through it. Through it. Uh, the other, the more common way was to say, we're going to take a, a benefits or a wage cut, or we won't demand wage increases as long as you give us better benefits, because that's in a sense it's a deferred cost. It can sort of put things off until the city comes back uh, into financial better times. And so it's particularly ironic, I think, now that people are turning around and saying, your benefits are too good. You have, you know, you've caused this financial crisis when the reason the benefits are better is because they actually did that as a deal to help these cities weather the financial crisis beforehand. So I don't know if that's the question, but yeah. okay. are we out of time? Yeah. Thank you again, Will Jones, for a wonderful lecture. Many thanks to all of you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next year at the fifth annual Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture.